Hello, and welcome to the Office of State Archaeology's uh, 2018 lecture series. Uh, throughout the year, the OSA will be hosting uh, monthly speakers uh, to present archaeological research conducted throughout the state. All lectures are free and open to the public, and this year we will be live streaming uh, these lectures. Today, it's my honor uh, to introduce our June speaker, uh, Ms. January Costa. January is a, the curator of archaeology and collections for the Lincoln County Historical Association located in downtown Lincoln, to North Carolina. Ms. Costa grew up in Gaston County, or uh, in Gastonia, North Carolina, and started in the field of archaeology and museum work at the age of 12, volunteering for the Shield Museum of Natural History. This experience led her to pursue undergraduate studies at Appalachian State University and graduate studies in archaeology and heritage management through the Univ University of Leicester in England with a focus in landscape archaeology. January is currently involved in educational programming, archaeology volunteer programs, workshops, historical preservation activities, and ongoing research for the Lincoln County Historical Association. In addition, she continues to work as an independent archaeological consultant working on projects within the southeast with a particular research focus on the late 18th and to 19th century rural and urban historic farmsteads in the Catawba Valley of North Carolina, as well as uh, ceramic uh, manufacture and typologies. Today, Ms. Costa will present an overview of the archaeological program in Lincoln County, North Carolina. Uh, Lincoln County is situated within North Carolina's western Piedmont region and is one of the oldest counties west of the Catawba River. This landscape is rich with early landmarks and historic sites, which serve as reminders of the pioneers that came to the area in search of new opportunities and rich farming. The Lincoln County Historical Association established the archaeology program in 2008 with the goal of uh, to document, study, and educate the public about the cultural resources and history of Lincoln County. January Costa will discuss her role with the archaeology program in Lincoln County over the past 10 years. Please join me in welcoming Ms. January Costa. Hello, everybody. All right, is it on? Should I just start? Okay. Um, okay, so as you mentioned, um, we work downtown. Um, my career field has been, it was, you know, anthropology is what I did in undergrad. I definitely focused in archaeology. I minored in geology to help with uh, identifying lithics, which has been very, very useful over the years. Uh, my title is Curator of Archaeology and Collections. Um, again, yeah, I started the program in 2008. Um, we are actually located, my lab is on the second floor of this building, which was originally the old First Baptist Church. It was built in 1922. Um, wonderful building. Um, but So my lab is in there. We are actually located on Main Street, uh, right downtown Lincoln. So if you're in downtown Lincoln, come on and stop by and see us. We also have our small museum in there as well. That's us. Um, so I always like to give a little overview for people in case you don't know what archaeology is. Um, archaeology is the study of past human cultures through the analysis of the material evidence that they left behind. And then, of course, in other words, archaeologists examine artifacts. These objects are basically the trash left behind by people over time. The examination of artifacts allows archaeologists to interpret the story of people in the past. And the artifacts are then curated for, for future research. So my specialization and area of focus is 18th and 19th century um, historic ceramics and backcountry studies, meaning, you know, in the backcountry. I'm not looking at coastal stuff. I will do that for comparison reasons. Um, but I'm very interested in looking at what our folks in the backcountry were actually using and what they had access to. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, we didn't have anything where we were. We didn't have anything really pretty or nice or you know, things like that. But from what we see, there's t tons of evidence that show that we, we definitely had plenty of access to the types of artifacts that everybody were using at the time period. Um, and I specifically, I'm a ceramic person. That's what I love. So I love using ceramics to identify and give myself dates um, to, for the diagnostics based on all these different patterns is how we do it. If you basically, we learn what these different types are and the decorations. Oh, and the decorations. And then we're able to... Um, basically date them based on these types. So so this is a typical day uh, for me in the Lincoln County Archaeology Program. Um, again, I started this program. Uh, we've been around, the organization has been around since 1955. 
Um, and then in 2008, I came along, convinced them they needed an archaeologist. <laughs> And I said, I want to create a program, and so that's what we did. And with that program, we've been able to accomplish a whole lot. Um, I still want to accomplish way more. Um, but we've been doing a really, really good job with stuff. We do field work, of course, lab work, research, public outreach. I have a wonderful uh, group of volunteers that help me. Lots of retired folks like to come out and uh, work with us on, on projects that we're doing. In the past, we've done archaeology camps for kids. Um, over the last few years, I have not done that. I want to get back into that. Um, but the kids think it's too hot, and they don't want to work more than four hours. So, you know, we got to, which I understand, um, but it is hot in the summer. But I have to wait till after school gets out for them to be able to have the camp. So hopefully that's something we can get back going soon. But we also have so many projects right now that it, it kind of makes it difficult. Um, so field work, you know, working with volunteers and students. Um, basically, one of the first things we were able to do was I was able to go out to uh, one project that was Woodside, which was it's this top left photo right here. We just did some shovel testing, which was really great for kids because, you know, they could sit there and dig one hole and they're not, I'm not having to completely focus on, I'm very particular about the data and the recording process. And when I'm the only one actually recording it, then it can come, become stressful. So shovel testing isn't as difficult for me to manage as just one person. So, um, but again, we'll do, we've worked at um, Historic Ingleside, which is a historic house site, uh, plantation site, or farmstead, as I'd like to refer to it, in uh, Lincoln County. Um, this was actually something we did. So yeah, this was in 2011 when we started working there. Uh, we were told, basically, that there was a house here um, there is definitely a hearth that was over here, lots of rubble. I've decided it's a kitchen site, um, which is next to the main house site. And of course, one of our wonderful volunteers, Edward Little, um, and he's found a wonderful, cool little shirt here, which we'll talk about in a little bit. He found a key, which could have been part of the building uh, that we were finding associated with. Um, so to go back to my work environment, um, this is our lab and my processing center which changes, this looks way different than it does right now. <laughs> um, but we keep it busy, you know, we try to handle everything properly as much as we can, we get a lot done. Um, but we are filling up, which is a good thing, I guess. Um, we also, like I said, have done the camps, um, the public outreach, which, you know, I've got here stated the partnership with the Exploring Jorah Foundation, um, which is at the Berry site, which, when I first started doing the camps, we were going up there a lot. Like in the summer, I would take the campers up there. Um, and so that's what a lot of these photos are from. Um, and again, the Berry site's also known as Juarez, the site of the Spanish fort called Fort San Juan, built in 1567. Um, but David Moore and I, we've you know been talking a lot. He's just recently come and done some se several talks for us. And we're really trying to sort of merge our program some. So look forward to some of the planning that we will be doing in the future. Okay, so educational programming. I'm gonna put this down for a minute. Um, let's see. Basically with my job, I'm not just the archeologist. Um, and I can't quit doing, like coming up with things. I need to stop coming up with ideas probably, but we basically created, I guess now it's been three years, um, which is what these ladies are doing up here, the Lincoln County Hearth Cooks. And I was really interested in starting this group. I don't personally do hearth cooking, um, but based on the ceramic research I've done, and for this time period, this is definitely colonial time period, we have a cabin out at our battleground site, and I just really wanted to make use of it. And so we started the group so that we could actually have events, but I also wanted to really start thinking about how people were using these locally made wares that we have access to in an environment that it would have been used in. So that's sort of where that thought process came for me with this type, with this group. And we are actually planning to do some, we did classes uh, last year and the year before. We're trying to build the group. Um, so we'll actually be hoping to have some more classes this summer, actually. We're trying to, you know, get more people to join. Um, another one of the things I do is artifact table displays. I'm constantly going to events. Somebody will call me. You know, want to bring artifacts. Sometimes it's Native American stuff. Sometimes it's later historic stuff. Sometimes it's all ceramics. Um, it depends on what the, the situation is. I was just at the Blackburn Pottery Festival, which is a local pottery event we have recently. Um, 
And I've discovered, we've discovered a kiln site, and it's a Blackburn kiln, so I thought what better way to go and try to get money <laughs> is at the actual uh, 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 event that they have for the potters. So that's the kind of stuff we do with that. I've also been to, um, I don't know if everybody knows where Turtle Island is, where Eustace lives. Um, he's had me come out several times to do the Native American display. Um, I have a lot of reproduction stuff that Steve Watts had made for me for students, and so it's really great because students and kids can actually come up and actually touch the stuff without me having to worry about it breaking or anything. Um, and then, of course, we have the UNCC class visits. Um, being with what I do, and then also because I do work with the Shield Museum, um, I'm definitely involved with a lot of the stuff going on at UNC Charlotte. Um, so Dr. Alan May will bring, there he is right there, um, he will bring his students to my class and we do, we talk ceramics usually, that's all I want to talk about. So that's what all these are. I'm working on a um, ceramic type collection actually for us. It'll be the only one in, the, um, in our area that, other than I know of one here, which is a really nice one. Um, so that would be good to have. And that'll be good also for students because, you know, they can come up and do the research and figure out what stuff is by identifying it with the type collection. So, so site visits and research. Um, I spend a good amount of time doing this too. People will call me. Um, basically, with my position, you know, I tend to look at more later historic period stuff. Um, and we were just discussing this a while ago, but people will call me and say, you know, I found this, you know, in my yard, or I found this on the creek. And a lot of time it is Native American stuff, um, earlier pre-contact period stuff, and I'll go and I'll, you know, try to write up a, a form and I'll identify it and photograph it and that kind of thing and see if it'll lead anything, but a lot of times it doesn't. Um, but with that also, we get a lot of activity going to historic sites, later historic sites. Um, this right here is, I'm trying to remember, this one actually is a site over in Denver, um, which is a farmstead that we're hoping to actually do some re more research on in the coming year, um, which was a plantation site, and it's kind of hush hush for now, but this site right here actually is Magnolia Grove, and we've been there, we went there a few years ago, and again, time, I have to limit my time with things. Um, because I'm, I'm only part-time, so I try to juggle all of this as much as I can. Um, but this house, actually, we found evidence, actually, from David Moore had actually done stuff a while back and actually done a survey that we found, and there's remains of a tavern um, behind the house site, which I'd love to get into and investigate, but again, we've got to sort of wait on that and hold off. Um, this is that other, I think that's, that's the same site as that chimney site. This is actually us doing uh, research. There's a pottery site actually in Virginia that I've been involved with, um, and it's because the potters actually came from Lincoln County, and then they moved to Virginia, um, and they built a kiln, and they built a groundhog kiln, which is fantastic because there's no evidence of those in Virginia. Um, but it's because that's what the technology was that they brought. And so we are, I'm hoping to do an article on this soon. Um, and we've been investigating and doing research on that. And then part of my type collection here and here, this was actually a trip I did uh, to Monticello, um, which has been a part of the whole thing with building my type collection. Uh, basically, I don't have a lot of examples of stuff and I do, you know, want to keep everything uh, with a provenance. So I've sort of done this whole thing over the last several years where I'll go and talk with, I've been to talk with Martha, Martha Zierden and Charleston, uh, again, them at Monticello, and we sort of trade. I've got tons of alkaline glaze <laughs> that's unprovenienced. Um, so I'll bring that for their collections, and then they'll let me have things that, uh, you know, is from their stuff that's unprovenienced, and they've now deaccessioned, and I've added it to my type collection, and of course, one thing I make sure to do is to make sure that every piece that comes from every one of those locations is marked where it came from, even if that, that still gives it some type of provenance, so if somebody's researching later, they can say, well, that one at least came from Charleston, or from that museum, or whichever, so. And then the archaeological consulting. Um, this is the Shill Museum, so this is my other lab I work in at the Shill Museum. Um, with Dr. Alan May, and then this right here um, picture is actually some of that pottery that I was looking at when we went to Virginia for that other kiln site that I'm um, researching, so it, it never ends. I will just keep researching and researching things. I can't, I can't stop. Um, 
So along with all this, we have our sites that we own and, and, and manage. So this up here um, is Madison Dare Iron Furnace, built in 1809 and pretty much stopped function in the 1870s. If you're not familiar with the iron furnaces, they are very um, prominent in our area. The land wasn't as uh, farmable in some places, and so they would get land grants um, on heavy iron ore spots that couldn't be farmed, and they would build these furnaces, which all they do is you basically, this is hard to tell in this photo, but you'd have a ramp that's up. It's actually, there's a ramp here, but there's another ramp up here. And then a, a ramp would come across on this stack. And then we, there has been, Dr. Alame excavated around this area back in the late or early 2000s, I guess. And we found the remnants of the, the metal plates that would have been in the ground with sand. So the molten iron actually flows out of this into sand that's sort of carved. And then it forms what we call bar stock, which is just big, lar large pieces of well, bar stock or pig iron. Uh, which we have several examples of stamped from the furnaces at our museum, which are pretty cool. So that's that. We do. We haven't done a whole lot. Um, that archaeology that was done by Dr. LMA, we did write a report up for that. Um, I want to do more out there, but we can't. We have a problem with the ground penetrating radar because there's so much metal and slag and iron ore in the ground that we're trying to figure out ways to get around that. Um, because we would love that with the, with the iron furnace industry, there definitely would have been slaves working at this site. Um, and we want to know about them and find out any information we can, um, see if we could find the, the homes that they were living in. So that's all future research, hopefully. Um, this building right here is the Jacob, For Jacob Forney house. So Peter Forney built the furnace. Jacob was his son. This now sits... Actually, if you're up the hill back from this, we, we, they put it up here. This was before I came. Um, they moved it because it was going to be destroyed. So we, I guess the, the organization felt, of course, that, well, we can save it. We'll put it on our site, and at least it's kind of related as far as the story of this family. Um, <clears throat> it has yet to be restored. Again, you know, we're a small nonprofit. We're doing as much work as we can. Um, but with all these projects, we, you know, have to continue to try to seek funding for things like this, but one day we hope to have this restored. Um, and a lot of people want to see this uh, functioning, so I don't, <laughs> that's a lot to think about, um, because we actually did go to Hopewell Furnace, which um, was up in Pennsylvania a lot, I don't know, it's been two years ago. Oops, excuse me. We went there a couple years ago, and there's this actually functioning. And I was just like amazed by it, but again, a lot, a lot of work and a lot, a lot of money. Uh, so we'll just continue sticking to our archaeological research for now, I think, probably. Um, Ramsers Mill, we are pretty active at Ramsers Mill right now. This building right here is that log structure that the hearth cooks were cooking in. Um, it was also moved here to our battleground, um, and it represents, it's supposed to represent Christian Reinhardt's uh, house. He was there. Um, when the battle occurred on June 20th, 1780. Um, the actual mill, we believe, is down, down this way, out by the creek. Um, again, I'm sort of investigating that right now, but so that's why, and that would have been on Ramser land across the creek, which is why it's called Ramser's Mill instead of Reinhardt Mill, because it wasn't his mill. Um, and, we, and I'll get to this in a little bit. We've been doing a lot of work there as well. And then we also own the Mundy House uh, Research Center, which we just restored several years ago and it's actually over in Denver. So this is, we're downtown Lincolnton, and we have our cultural center there for the western part, and then this is our eastern research center. Um, and we just try to, and it basically it just gives us another center for people on the eastern section to sort of get involved with programming and doing things. And they, we have a sort of a separate board, um, and they've been handling a lot of stuff, doing a great job with programs and just getting speakers to come in and talk. And, um, the inside is sort of like a museum a little bit. You can walk around, and we have right now a basket exhibit that we that was put together. So we try to rotate things in and out of there for people to see. <clears throat> so Ramsers Mill Battleground. Uh, yeah, the battle was June 20th, 1780. It looks a lot bigger <laughs> on these photographs than it actually is. Um, but here, here's the cabin. This structure right, structure right here was also moved out to the site. Um, there's a road right here that curves around. What we run into at this site, all of this is owned by the county. Part of our HPC actually owns part of this as well. Um, as you can see, there's a grave here. 
Uh, this marker was actually put later, put in there later. We have the original marker actually at the office to protect it. This path leads down to the, the creek, which we believe, you know, where the mill was. Um, but all of this is a major, major floodplain. So I deal with that issue of, you know, if anything was left in context, um, it's definitely been flooded. But this whole landscape from back here back was, uh, or was part of the battlefield, but there's three schools on, our prop on the property that were built like in the 70s. And so that kind of, you know, messed things up a little bit. Um, so we own what we can are trying to work with what we can um, as far as the preservation of the site. It's not on the National Register. Um, we need the, the State Historic Preservation Office to approve it. Uh, but we need, I guess, to find more stuff. So we're working on that. Um, back in 2008, um, this is when I started for Lincolnton. And this was a project, actually, that the Lincoln County Historical Association had hired Dr. Alan May to actually do. And he hired me. <laughs> so me and Tracy Martin, some of you may know him, um, actually went out to what we call the mass grave. And so what this is, and you can sort of see there's a little monument here, and then there's this marker that goes around in a square. This was all done after uh, a man back in the 90s, um, he had been hired to do, a, like basically they were told, everybody was told that this was the mass grave. Everybody after the battle would have been thrown into a big grave and covered up. Um, he came and did excavations, and then he went basically, I'd say maybe this deep, and he hit dark soil, and he hit big stones, um, which you can sort of see, I mean, you're starting to hit these rocks here at this level, at level two. So we're like, okay, and then at, in this first little bit that we were getting, we were getting historic artifacts. We were getting like late 1880s type things, some yellowware, some whiteware, ironstone, cut nails, um, alkaline glazed stoneware, which is still used. And then, but we decided, of course, we're going to dig through that feature. He hit that stone and that dark soil and said, well, this is the burial. And he didn't dig through it. So we dug through it, and when we dug through it, we found this deep, massive uh, barrels, metal barrels. Um, there was also tires. Coke bottles, all kinds of modern trash. Um, and so after doing some research, we found out that this was a ravine at one point, and it was actually used uh, as a trash dump. People would bring their stuff and just dump it into this hole. Um, now, I got down, we had to stop basically, basically for kind of like OSHA standards. <laughs> to one point, I couldn't dig anymore. I couldn't get around anything. I had like one little spot, like I think it was right here, and I'm troweling and but I didn't hit subsoil, so I would eventually like to get um, some machinery out here and go through this again and see if I can get underneath it to see if I can hit subsoil. Um, because people still want to say, well, it's still the mass grave. You didn't go as deep as you could have. So I'm saying what he found was not the mass grave, um, but basically we also found out the reason he thought, he thought those artifacts were colonial that we were finding, and we found out there was a house that stood up the hill right here. Well, you have to think about sheet wash, I mean rain, erosion. Um, it was an eye house, it dated 1870s, 1880s. And so all that stuff has been washing down here. And he had, had labeled the stuff like a, <clears throat> a cut nail, you know, was labeled as a rot nail. And an alkaline glaze was labeled as salt glazed stoneware. So it's just, it was, there was just some confusion on the identification of the artifacts. Um, but that's why people, like, I have to explain to them, they're like, well, why were you finding all that 1800 stuff on top of all this modern stuff? But that's why, because this was thrown in, and then this stuff washed on top of it over the years. And so, so that's a project that, you know, was done, but eventually we may do some more research um, with that. We will see. Uh, more stuff with the battlefield to skip ahead. This is basically just this past December, right after Christmas. Um, we decided to raise money to do the ground penetrating radar. And basically this was stemmed because um, we sort of put things on hold for a while out there. Um, we didn't really know what else we could do. It wasn't a focus right now. But the South Carolina Battle Ground, Battlefields Preservation Trust, I think is what they're called, um, they contacted us last year and we had meetings. And they are interested in sort of helping us and we'll be on one of their revolutionary war trails for battlefields. 
And because of that, they're, they, they've asked for us to do as much research as we can to help get funding for things, like possibly purchase more property and stuff like that. So I immediately jumped on that. Um, we got someone to donate the money for the survey, and we use, um, is that him? No, that's Tim. Th this guy, his name's Keith Sermer. He's at uh, App State um, through the geology department. Um, we love him and adore him. He's awesome. Um, but he came out and set it up for us. And so what we did was we did this whole, that whole bottom, like I showed you before, all this, all the way down to the, the creek um, to find out if we could hit anything. Again, like I said, we've got this, uh, and it was plowed too there. So we've got a flood zone plus plowing occurring. Um, but what we found, and this was his grid system up here. So this is how he set it up. This is our geophysical grid layout across the study area. Um, we had several, depth, G, several GPR depth slices, but I just picked this one because it's the easiest to actually see, but for, at 0 .2, 0 .4, or 0 0.4, um, it was interesting. I thought this was really interesting because he hit these, he found these hydric soils, and out there on that field, the grass is a completely different color there, and I've always wondered why. I couldn't figure out why, so that explains that, but he hit these circular features, one here and one here. Um, which he says are possibly tree throws. So like if there had been a storm in the past or something and a tree flew, blew over, it would leave that depression feature um, in the ground. So, but it's like he put it also, they could be cultural features. We don't know yet. So we will probably come back in the next year and do an, um, some testing, open up some units here and here, um, which is what this is really useful for. That's why, because I didn't want to have to shovel test that whole field. So something like this allows me to say, okay, over here, let's go over here and lay out a unit there. Um, what was really cool is we found this historic road, which goes right up by the cabin. Um, he also thinks there's another one here. I don't know about this one so much. We'll have to look at that. But we do have this water line that goes through. There's a sewer line that goes from the creek all the way out here through the woods. So he definitely hit the remnants of that. Um, I'm thinking this could be an access road for the equipment to do this. I think that's what that is. But this one, we were always told this road right here, actually this road right here, is labeled. It has a label on it, but we've always gone, okay. But it says Tuckasegee Road. And I'm like, okay, hey, was, was this the Tuckasegee Road? Did it come through here? Well, there's a possibility this could be the Tuckasegee Road. Don't quote me on that. It's a theory. I don't know for sure. Um, but it would be really cool if it is, which would then go out here to the creek and... Um, they basically crossed over towards the mill area. The other thing was that tree that you could see that other grave at is right over here and, um, yeah, right here. And it looks like there's possibly more burials. There was only one burial that we knew of right there. Um, I was hoping we may hit a mass burial, <laughs> but we didn't. Um, we did also hit, let's see, right here, this depression. If you look on Google Earth, um, you can actually see it in this field. There's a square depression. Um, we didn't, I had never even noticed it until last winter when we were out there. And then I got back on Google and looked it up. And then when he, so he, he sees that. He's saying it could be a cellar. I don't know. So I'm going to probably put some units in there to see if I can hit anything. Um, I think it's a weird spot to build a cellar for a house because it's in such a horrible floodplain because that other building, the cabin, that's beside the cabin, we've had the water go all the way up to the roof line. The, the flooding has been so bad. It has turned this whole area into a pond. Um, so I just, I'm not really sure about that. But that's what the, the geophysical survey has been really helpful for. Um, and we're also trying to, with the battlefield folks, they've basically told us if, it'd be really great if we could do a metal detecting survey. Um, so I'm working on trying to get that planned out um, for it so that then, and it'll be a professional archaeological metal detecting survey um, so that we can get whatever's out there up and sort of get an idea of what's actually going on on what we have left of the battlefield. Because as you can see, this is all disturbed up here. There's a practice field over here. Um, so yeah, that's what's going on there. So let me go back to Ingleside now. Ingleside I had talked about um, earlier and where that kitchen building was. And it's an absolutely beautiful house. It's privately owned. And it was built by Daniel Forney. Um, so the furnace was built by Peter Forney. Jacob Forney, that other house I showed you that we moved to the site, that was one of Peter's sons. Daniel is his other son. 
and Daniel was a congressman, but also a farmer. Um, he built, had this house built, and I've got on here designed by Benjamin Latrobe, who built the U.S. Capitol building, but w that's, a, that's a theory. We don't know for sure, um, but it is definitely believed that he designed the house, which makes it even more significant. We just don't have examples of stuff like this left in our area, so um, we adore this house and make sure to keep it okay. Um, but when we did the work back in 2010, what I did was just like I'll do one of these site visits, you know, I'll go. They're like, well, we can come out and take a look. So we just do an initial survey for one day, basically, and photograph um, and surface collect artifacts based on that. And then I map it all up and catalog it. And on the property, this is behind the house. Um, I think that's Jason, my boss, Hart. This was a smokehouse. Um, it's a little bit, it's like mid, I think, 1840s or something like that, if I remember correctly. This is a spring house that's on the property. Um, this is across the street from the property, and we strongly believe that this is a slave cabin associated with the plantation. Um, it's, there's a highway right here, and there's a highway right here. Um, so hopefully it won't ever get torn down, but I did do a little bit of testing in this area and found a little bit of stuff, but the only stuff I found basically suggests it was probably later used as a tenant house um, at the turn of the century and into the like 30s and 40s. Um, but no formal excavations have been done here, which we, we would like to do at some point. This structure is actually to the side of the house, sort of away from it, two-story, it has a hearth. I found an absolutely beautiful piece of mocha ware, dipped ware, which I'll show you in a minute what that is, out here, which is like 1780-1820 range. Um, and we found some other things in the house. I think this could also have been used by, serve, you know, by slaves, um, doing cooking and things like that, outside the kitchen. This could have just been another dwelling, I think. We don't know if that structure was original to the property either, if it was moved there or not. So when we did the excavations, this was over by the house, um, to the right of the house. And so then that other two-story building is further away from there. And this is that possible kitchen area, which, like I said, I've pretty much decided was a kitchen. There's a fallen um, hearth, it's right here. We only did tests on this side. So this whole area over here could still be tested at some point. Um, found a lot of stuff. I mean, we found a whole lot of stuff. Here's some more pictures of the excavations. We tried not to move the rocks, but sometimes we had to. <laughs> but we mapped everything, so everything's photographed. But here's some of the stuff we found. We found prosser buttons, which if you're an archeologist, you definitely recognize in the historic period. Um, these are all porcelain buttons, also referred to as China buttons. Um, they date post 1840, so they're a really good indicator for us for dates. Um, then you have your other buttons. These are shell and bone button. And then we had some other just random metal buttons that we found. Um, further analysis, I'm trying to get the report together for all of this. I'm still working on it because there's so much stuff to do. Um, and then I'll submit it to the state, and that'll be great. <laughs> so I'll have a copy of it. These were just interesting things I put together because um, you got your bone toothbrush, you got your bone toothbrush, and you got bone handles probably from little knives, um, the slate pencils, the thimble. Um, Marble, which we find a lot of times on these types of sites, doll, hand, uh, arm, um, and then parts of buckles. And then, and most of this was found, you know, what I realized is that this was also a dump area. People were probably dumping a lot of trash into this after it was a, the, the building was abandoned. Um, but once we got down into it, things were in context, and we definitely have a good context for um, the house was built 1817, 1819, that would, this structure would have been built at the same time pretty much is what we believe. But then it would have probably been used way later also and lived in, and that was suggested by this stuff or just trash, I don't know. Um, but these are key cans, I don't know if anybody recognizes those, like from Spam or <laughs> any kind of early cans. And we probably, I think we're up to 200 count of those. It's a lot of them. Um, the regular later, you know, like marbles, toothpaste thing. These were not fun. Um, the hypodermic needles or syringes, um, we probably have about 50 of those. And so when you're screening those, that's not fun. You could get really hurt. And I had kids at this site, it's like, uh. Um, but luckily, I don't think that any of them encountered anything. Um, but yeah, so we had to be very, very careful that day we were out there. But 
there's, uh, but with all this, you know, you've got this more modern uh, take on the stuff that they're throwing in there. The depression glass, I love depression glass, so I pulled these out to show as examples. Um, this was actually, probably you've seen this stuff in an antique store. It's actually usually like a red color painted, um, and I think it's like a devil deviled egg plate or something like that that you would put that, those things on. These are our actual shirts of the hobnail we got, um, but I found this that looks very similar. I think it could have been that type of form, or it could have just been a bowl, but it would have looked similar to that. And of course, this is depression glass. This is, you know, 1920s, 30s, 40s range. And I think I might be able to put this back together because we have so much of it as well. And then, of course, you get your fun stuff too. You get, you know, archaic stuff, basically. Um, this was at the bottom level in our kitchen area, which, you know, I have people ask, well, why are you getting this with the, the other stuff? Well, because Native Americans were here before anybody else moved here, so they could have built it. However, this type of stuff also makes me think, because there wasn't a whole lot else in there, that these were just picked up by these people that lived here and that were using the kitchen, just like we like to pick up things and look at them. So these items were in that two-story cabin that's still sitting there um, that I think could be a slave cabin. These were actually under the floors that we had actually pulled up, um, and we found these peach pits, this buckle, this alkaline glaze, which is an earlier form of alkaline glaze stoneware, which is made locally in our area, in the Catawba Valley, is this alkaline glaze. Um, and then these are the mocha wares, or dip wares, we call them, um, with the engine turning and all the other little dons. dons. These are all pearl ware, so this is all 1780. 1820 range, so I think that's an earlier structure. Um, I didn't see anything to suggest that um, it would be later. So that hopefully will be something we can do investigations at also. And I'd love to do GPR testing in Ingleside as well. So This was that ceramic that our volunteer Ed was holding. Um, and if you're not a member of the Transferware Club, it's awesome. Um, I wasn't for years online, and we had found this, and I had done research and done research on this blue transfer print, and it does say French scenery, but I still couldn't find anything, and I finally got it down to where I thought it was the Herculaneum pottery over in England, but wasn't completely sure, and then we joined the Transferware Club, and I found this within 10 minutes after I'd spent years looking for it, and I found the whole plate, so I was really excited. Um, and this is really great, you know, for us, that's what I try to tell people, is that now I have an example of what they were using. You know, what are they eating off of? That's the point. We're trying to figure out what, you know, all the different things that they were using, so, and how they were using them. And here's some more of the mocha wares. Um, I put this in here just as an example so you can see a whole piece, but here's those uh, other, the worm is what we call it, some dendritic, which is this, which was done by Tabasco juice or uh, urine as well. Um, then we have our uh, monochrome blue hand painted pearl wares that are pretty early. Um, some of these are pearl wares, and then you've got white wares that are polychrome hand painted. And then the more common um, shell edges, which we find everywhere at these historic sites. Um, this was the, the, what everybody loved. They loved this stuff. So it went through a major emergence of people using them. And I put Rob Hunter's. Um, little shell edge thing in here. So you can just sort of see there were different versions of this shell edge. And the earlier versions were way more scalloped. Um, the painting on them was done with more detail. And as time went by, they got a lot lazier. And they would swipe it like that. They're just like, well, we're not going to do, do all this details with the feathering. So um, that just shows we've got a little bit of variety here, which is good for the time periods. So I just want to show you that. And these were the stone wares. Um, all alkaline glaze. So a variety of stonewares were found, including Catawba Valley alkaline glaze. The gray salt glaze is right here, um, which I was kind of surprised about because that's usually Virginia, but I guess in our area we probably would have had access to that. Um, the Bristol and Albany, which is here. Um, the English brown salt glaze, and then yeah, the other blue cobalt. You can't really see it. It's right here. We don't ever find the blue cobalt stuff, but that's what that is. And here's just a picture I put it here of what the alkaline glaze stuff looks like. And again, so that other stuff that we were looking at was imported wares coming from England. All those painted wares we're looking at, the shell edge, all that. These are going to be the local wares. So this alkaline glaze stuff. Um, over here, these big utilitarian pots, you know, they were used for storage and, you know, whiskey and all kinds of things, um, pickling, and this was your Tupperware of the day, 
which makes me crazy because you break it. <laughs> it's like, um, but so that's what these are pieces of. So you can see that. And again, made in the Catawba Valley, which is really important to note. The coarse earthen wares I just want to throw in here, um, or red wares. I'm back and forth on this red ware thing right now, but um, these are you know lead glazed earthen wares. Um, so you couldn't eat off these now because it would be very bad. You'd get sick. Um, these were found at that hearth kitchen area at Ingleside. And this basically got me started on the other research I've been doing over the years, which was the fact that we had so many of these shirts coming out of this site. And typically in our area, you would say, well, these earthenwares came from like um, Alamance County, you know, or in Winston-Salem area, you know, Old Salem, the Moravians, you know, they're, they're doing, doing the leg glazed wares. And I was just, I couldn't accept that because we have potters in our area making this other pottery. So I said, you know, they had to have been making earthenwares. They had to have, uh, especially when we've got all of this coming up. Um, and these do date to around the construction of Ingleside. And we did have this lovely molded um, pipe bowl fragment, which is good, which basically this is what we call a substem pipe. Um, sometimes they're anthropomorphic with a face on them. Um, they basically are just sort of like a V shape and you would have had the reeds sticking in them to smoke them. And again, that could be made locally. We don't know for sure if it was made locally. I think they could be, um, which is where I wanted to introduce Weaver, um, which has been something that we've worked on over the years. Uh, there was Johann Jacob Weaver II. We always kind of knew about him, but it was kind of a myth, kind of a ghost story situation. Um, and then several years ago, Linda Carnes McNaughton she was contacted by family members, and basically we started on sort of on this journey. Um, and then I went to the Catawba County Museum, and she had already been there too, and we noticed that they had these two plates um, that are this slip decorated ware that looks similar to the stuff from Old Salem. And then, of course, Joanna at Meza in Old Salem in her collections, I went up there and saw this, and I was like, okay, that looks like Weaver because here's the family stuff. And so their stuff, you can see this definite scraffito is what we call it, where you basically you put the slip on and then you take something and tool it to make that design, so through the clay slip. Um, they, that's what this matches. These, all three of these are that plate right there, that pan. Um, they also own these, and again, that's the same one that's here. And it has a J, one of them has a J, I can't remember if it's this one, has a J on the back of it, a big cursive J. Um, so does this one at Meza. And that one was being attributed to Oust, if I believe, before. So we were able to tell Joanna, no, 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 <laughs> that is a Weaver piece from the Catawba Valley, Catawba County, um, which would have been Lincoln County at this time period, which would have been the 17, late 1700s, early 1800s. So again, this is part of the family, um, Boucher family, all their pieces, which are great. They're fantastic stuff. Never seen this stuff before, so. Well, when we found out all of that, that was when, weirdly, at the same time, um, a man contacted me, Mr. Wilson, and he had been metal detecting, which often is the case, and he basically, when he was metal detecting, started hitting all this pottery, so he's like, well, I need to know what it is. I need to know what it is. So we go out there, and I look at the pottery, which is why I immediately said we're, we're excavating. And he had already dug a, this is water, if I remember. Yeah, the, the water is right here. It's right on the creek. Our unit literally is almost, I mean, in the creek. Um, we opened up four units. Um, and then, again, his, his hole was right here. And he dug like a hole that went back in here, not a square. <laughs> So I had to even it up somehow, but he had dug this deep. So we cleaned it all out, and there are sherds all mixed in here. Um, and basically what we figured out is, from what I've gathered, um, is that it was a refuse pile of debris. Uh, basically, if you, here's the creek, if you're sort of up the hill a ways, uh, his father, the guy that owns the property, said if, at one point there was an old house that sat up on top of the hill. And there's also a natural, or a natural spring out here that he still actually uses that is stone lined, so it would have been used. And so I was like, I tried to look on the aerials, I couldn't see anything, and now there's a big, huge house that sits up at the top of the hill now, so nothing can be excavated up there. Um, but within this mix, oops, we were getting um, all this wonderful stuff. 
And if you notice, there's our pattern. There's our weaver plate that's a, you know, that the family owns, that's in the museum, both the museums. Um, but then I was getting all these other ones. This one is extremely interesting. Um, we've talked about it. There's a guy in Virginia, I think Piercy, that we think could have, it's similar to his stuff. He's the only person we could find that it's similar to. But again, this is all in a refuse pile. This is not a kiln site. So, but I was like, this looks like Weaver stuff. And there sure is a whole lot of it versus when we're at a normal historic site. Um, so again, we counted, you know, we've got all, but I've got bags and bags and bags of it. And again, just to show you, there's that pattern. And then there's that piece. But then I was really interested because we had all these paste colors, the inside color of the um, shirts and all these different designs. There's black on them, which at first I thought was, some of them have this black edging on them. And if you look at Moravian pottery, sometimes they would put a, a sort of a black slip on the bottoms um, and around the edges. But after we've looked and I've gone back and forth with several colleagues, we all agree that these are just burned, so they were cooking in them, which is fantastic to figure that out. Um, they're using these really great type slipware pieces to, you know, bake in, basically. We also found this anthropomorphic pipe fragment, which again is part of a pipe bowl. Um, it's molded. You can see the seam right here. Um, and we, then we also found pearlware. And these were within that context of those ceramics. So. I've got lots of pearlware, so there is really nothing in any of this that is, I would say, post-1850. It's all 1780 to 1840 range. Um, there's a ton of slag, though, which was on top of it, so I don't know if they brought slag in for erosion purposes at some point, but we had a lot of slag that were in huge chunks like you would get at our furnace site, so I'd it's been suggested there could have been a kiln site nearby. Um, we've not yet found one, but we did investigate the actual Weaver kiln. Linda Carnes McDalton leaded that several years ago in 2013, I think it was. Um, we opened up one unit in there and were able to get some pieces of bisque ware, which was great. Um, we've been doing analysis. I've been running stuff on XRF, PXRF um, analysis to look at the actual clay components of the minerals in the clay to see if we can actually source some of this stuff. So that's all in process. We've got UNCC students actually working on some of this as well. I love passing along the ideas so that they will get it done. <laughs> Help me with the research. Um, and then this brings me to the latest stuff that I'm doing, um, which I just did an article in for the North Carolina Archaeology Society newsletter. And this is the Michael Butt Brown Presley House in Laketon, North Carolina. This is actually right downtown Lincoln. If you go around the courthouse, um, it's the backyard of one of this structure right here. Um, we basically, we just started digging because we had, a, we had permission. I mean, I get to research a lot of stuff I want to, which is great. Uh, so we started opening up some units and then of course started encountering all this brick. And if anybody has thoughts, I would really appreciate it. Um, we've been going back and forth. We haven't been back out yet this field season. This was last year. I'm about to start next week, hopefully, and we're gonna open it back up and start doing some more stuff. But there's just all this brick rubble, and then we've got some of it's lined up, but it's at an angle. So I thought, well, if it's a structure, it's not lined up with the house. Um, so we're just not sure. But within this, we've had lots of different 17, you know, um, 1780, 1820 range stuff. 1820 to 1840 stuff, 1850 to 1870 stuff, and later. So, you know, there's a ton of material in there. As far as getting a date, it's been kind of difficult. Um, but because of this, I had questions. So we did more GPR. Um, and then we use, these maps right here are fire insurance maps, which are absolutely wonderful for historic sites in a downtown environment, because then you have these maps that basically are the latest we have or the earliest we have are 1890. Um, but this one shows the house that you can see right here is the house and this little L sticks off. Um, but it shows right here is a barn that was right here. There's also another stable area which is basically over here somewhere. And about right in here somewhere is this structure. Um, 
I know these were stables, which is great, but I don't know what this is. And it's, two, it's a two-story two story wooden structure. If it's in yellow, the, the map will show you um, for the, what it'll have it labeled. It shows you all the, all the stuff that's in yellow is wood structures. And all the red ones, or the pink ones, are brick structures. So we actually have that had a smokehouse, oddly, right beside the stairs, right here. I don't understand why, but I, you can see evidence of it. It's a more modern structure, again, 1890. Um, but again, we don't know why that was there. And then there's a doctor's office that's over here, which is what this is. Um, again, this was basically, you've got the four, I call it the Michael Butt Brown Presley House, Dr. Butt, Dr. Brown, and Dr. Presley. So they were all doctors after that. Uh, Michael, we think when he got the house, we think it was about um, 18, well, no, we think the house was built in 1819 or so, based on John, um, who actually got the house originally. And then when Dr. Butt came in, he actually got an insurance policy for the structure and also for a doctor's office that was not there. And also the insurance policy talked about a kitchen. So it's been my thought that, and that was in 1847, if I remember correctly, it was in the 1840s. He basically, we're thinking, what I'm thinking is, this could be remnants somehow, I haven't figured it out structurally, of an earlier kitchen before this kitchen. Because this is all right here. Um, it would put it a good distance from the house. But the house, we believe, was 1819. And then if Dr. Buck comes in and buys an insurance policy to build a kitchen and a doctor's office, that would be this and the doctor's office. So, and we also noticed the same year that he did that, um, apparently there's a, there is a receipt where he purchased the bricks from the old jail and reused them. And these bricks match the brick in the doctor's office next door. So I think those could be actual bricks from the original jail as well. But if that's the case, this wasn't here until 1840s, then there had to be for this structure between 1819 and 1840s, a kitchen out here. Um, so that's what I think and hope this is. And we've got the artifacts that have been suggesting some stuff. So we'll see. I'm not really sure completely. But this right here shows our downtown area. This was done, I'm trying to remember when this was done. It was done by Nixon, I think, and it was a little bit later. But this shows the town lots, how they were set up. A grid system was very typical in a downtown area. Um, these were our lots right here. Originally, all this was vault. And then uh, Michael bought this one and half of this one. And then they stayed together for a while. Um, and right here is where the doctor's office was. So this just shows you in context to the courthouse. And it's sitting on the grid system. Um, then here's Keith again. We did this last November. Um, he did GPR testing. Because I just wanted to see if we could pick up these structures. Um, and this was our results. Um, trying to see what we've got on here. This one's a little bit easier to see. So there is a roadbed that you can actually see the depression of. Well, he's calling it a roadbed, but we also found evidence that there was uh, grapevines. So I think this is not actually a roadbed. I think this is just an area where there was a row, it's a depression right here in the middle, and then there was a row of grapevines here and a row of grapevines here. Um, because Dr. Presley, they were involved apparently with making wine for the church. <laughs> later on, so that would make sense. And there's people that remember the grapevines being there. So I'm like, please find a photograph. That would be awesome. Um, but throughout all here, he did the GPR testing. We couldn't test here because we had already pretty much excavated. But we did hit that flagstone, if I go back, this right here. And we hit several other pieces of flagstone. And again, these bricks um, lined up. Don't really know what's going on there. But that flagstone, we were digging here, and that flagstone does end. So that's where I'm going to plan on digging next week, hopefully. And we're going to see where we can find that finishing up. And then right here beside the kitchen that's here, um, we have possible privies. So that could be interesting. We'll see. I don't know if I want to dig that far in the ground. I'm kind of afraid. Um, may have to recruit some volunteers for that. Uh, so we're going to look into that, see what we can find. And then I'm very interested in this outbuilding because I think that could have also, if, if we didn't have a kitchen over here, maybe this could have been a kitchen, um, two-story building, who knows what it was. That's the whole point is we want to dig into it and see if we can figure out what it was. So, um, And then here you can see where that barn, there was a barn there. I don't know if it shows up. Yeah, this one's great because he shows it where it's all laid out. So there's that other outbuilding and there's that barn. 
And here was some of the stuff we dug up, which is really great. This is the date. This is stuff I want it to date to for my kitchen. If I've got an early kitchen, we've got the alkaline glaze. We've got some lead glaze, redware, earthenware, so that's a little bit early. We've got our shell edges, but these are earlier type pearlware shell edges. Um, we have annular wear, which is, and all these are imported. All these are imported. Um, but again, this is, a, you know, that's a little bit later. And then this is a part of a piece of pearlware that has these big, beautiful flowers on it. We've got porcelain, uh, Chinese porcelain, which is great, bone button, and clay marbles. Um, and this beautiful little piece, I, it's blue transfer um, print, and it's pearlware. And I was, I actually haven't glued it back yet. I just had, I spent four hours one night at home putting that together to take a picture, which looks good, but we need to glue it back together. But it probably would just been like a little saucer that was used. Um, but that's an earlier pearlware um, design, so. And there's some more pieces of just random things we collected. This was really cool. Anybody recognize that, please let me know. Um, I sent many, many posts last year on Facebook about this pipe. It's a pipe bowl. It has an anthropomorphic face on it, but it doesn't look like any face I've really seen. Um, some people were thinking it could have been out of Virginia, but we all basically decided no. And Rob Hunter basically told me, no, I think it's probably local. And we will never know who made it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we'll see. But it's interesting because it has a face on it. Like if you're familiar with the stuff from our area, there's face jugs. And the face, the way the eyebrows are done and the eyes, it looks like a face jug. So it's just kind of blown away by that. We need to test it, I guess, do some XRF analysis. Um, this button also, I don't, I've don't. i looked at, at buttons to try to identify this particular button um, with this little star on it. Do you know? I don't know. Uh, thimble, we found out that was Austrian, which was really cool a little bit later. Green shell edge again, there's that blue piece. Um, and this was pretty interesting. This was uh, French gunflint that we found in a unit, um, which could, for some reason, date back to our battlefield, because this is like two streets over from our battlefield that I was discussing before, so. And that's all. I go on and on and on. Does anybody have any questions? Or? That's a lot of information in there. <laughs> Yes. The brick. Oh, that that smokehouse. Yeah. It would be, except that the bricks are later. They're all the later the bricks that the smokehouse where the smokehouse was. You can see remnants of them along the porch, and they are a much later turn of the century. You know, in a factory produced brick. The ones that we're uncovering that are down in the ground are all handmade bricks. So they're definitely earlier. I know. I wish that was the case, too. I was like, anything, because it looks like it's a wall almost at one point. I was talking to Martha Zierden about it. She's like, well, it looks like somebody just took a brick wall and pushed it over because they're at that angle. But then she says, but if they did that, she was like, is there mortar between them, the rows? And there's no mortar. So we just decided we have a path that leads to another path that leads to another path. <laughs> That's what we were joking about. It's like, so we'll ho I'm hoping after this... Uh, year after we do some more field work in the next few weeks hopefully we'll be able to find some more answers so we'll see and I'll give updates on that as well any other questions no? on behalf of the office office of state archaeology I'd like to thank Ms. Uh, Costa for joining us today and speaking about the historic and archaeological resources in Lincoln County. And I'd also like to thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you at our future uh, lecture series events. And be sure to check out our website, archaeology.ncdcr.gov, each month to um, follow up on our upcoming events. Thank you very much. Have a great, great day.